Our speaker today has, a, has an unusual success story. Dr. Jeff Thompson is CEO Emeritus of Gunderson Health System, a large healthcare organization headquartered in La Crosse, Wisconsin. About 15 years ago, Dr. Thompson began his medical career as a uh, pediatrician, then became CEO of Gunderson, and began to realize that the energy use of all large hospitals also equates to unhealthy and excessive emissions by the power plant serving them. This provides more unhealthy people for hospitals to treat. Even though the utility bills of hospitals are large, in the bigger picture, they only constitute about 6% of all overhead costs a CEO must try to cope with. In spite of this, Dr. Thompson embarked on an ambitious program to minimize the emissions of the new hospital being planned for Gunderson. Now, 15 years later, Dr. Thompson has accomplished cost-effective creation of the only energy independent hospital in the world. One of the cornerstones in this achievement is the Gunderson-owned manure digester in Middleton. We are honored to have Dr. Thompson at our meeting. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, I really, I really like the fact that I've only been a pediatrician 15 years makes me, you know, just 40. <laughs> my wife, my guest, Sandy, in the audience, probably disagree with that. I act far less than 40, but really, I'm much older than that. Um, I want to congratulate Dr. Bielman. Um, although, you know, not much sympathy for the good rabbi. He, of course, he had to knock on the door, and he was a little worried about people not paying attention to him. I'm a pediatrician, OK? They have televisions in the room. So my competition, my competition wasn't a football game. My competition was fuzzy talking animals, Power Rangers, and mermaids. I didn't have a chance. You never got anything out of the kids when you did rounds uh, in, in, uh, in pediatrics. Well, thanks for having me come. I'm, um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I have a huge respect for Rotary as any pediatrician, and a pediatrician with some international experience. There isn't a, a service club in, club in the world. There isn't a group in the world that's done more to improve the well-being of children around the world. Your polio campaign is stunning, historic, and having taken care of children with polio. Um, it is a, a terrible disease that changes lives. And the fact that you are doing something about it and have accomplished things is tremendous. And you should be very proud. Um, one, of my, one of my themes, in, in fact, will be doing something rather than just sitting. You're all fine. You can do your jobs. You can do all your things. You can just hang out. You don't have to take on the causes that you take on. Um, the same approach to our values is what we did at Gunderson. Our uh, approach to children, to adults, to health care is, um, is seated in our values. And that's, that's what I'm going to uh, uh, talk about. So, Gunderson is a, a health system. We have six hospitals, a lot of clinics, 7,000 employees, just to give you a little feel. We do a lot of education. We're the Western Medical Campus of, of uh, Madison, um, but we have our own residency and training programs. So we, we feel responsible for a big, a big part of, um, of uh, the upper Midwest there. Um, I, went, I went to CEO school, like many of you went. The first thing they do is teach you to brag. And so here's my bragging slide. And I just wanted to say, why did I put all these awards and all this national recognition? I put it up there because one of the first criticisms when we start talking about taking care of the environment is people say, oh, phew, there you go. Losing your way, not sticking to your core mission. You got to stick to your knitting. As a, there's a million analogies along this way that I ignored them all. Um, but I'm an ICU pediatrician, by the way. So short attention span, pay no attention to the rules. It, it's perfect for being a CEO. So we, we, <laughs> we, yeah, we won't make any political jokes saying it's perfect for being a president too. I wouldn't say that. Um, but the the uh, national recognition. We didn't compete against our former self. We didn't measure ourselves against our own mediocrity. We measured ourselves against the best in the country. We felt it was our obligation to our community. Our obligation was to improve the health and well-being 
of the patients and the communities we serve broadly, like housing, like food, like education. We went outside our walls. We said this is not, this is not our responsibility only to do a really good job taking care of sick people, wait till they get sick, show up, and then try and fix them. We need to move out into the community, so we started doing that um, years ago. I'm going to move through pretty quickly a number of things we did in a very focused area. Uh, when you get the slides, you can have the slides. You can look through all those other things. If you're interested in other parts, I'll be happy to send you information on that. But I'm going to focus, of course, mostly on the environmental impact piece. That's what I was asked to, and focus on the financial uh, piece of that. But I have to tell you, I believe that the reason we are successful had to do with our purpose and our values. It was having the courage to follow your values, the discipline to make it work, and the durability to put up a lot of criticism. You know, there's a lot of criticism anytime you break, break the mold a little bit. So off we went. Why? Why would we get excited about this? Why would this be important? Well, you already heard that. We, like everyone else, to heat and cool and run our organization, put pollutants into the air in the upper Midwest. It's mostly coal, it's at least half coal, uh, some uh, diesel, some natural gas. We put pollutants into the air that cause respiratory illnesses, all kinds of problems. Thousands of people die in this country of respiratory diseases. diseases. Seven million around the world die of respiratory diseases related to the air they breathe some indoor, some outdoor, we're causing part of that problem as a healthcare organization. That's probably not, uh, not a good thing to do. Healthcare organizations are more energy intense, two and a half times more intense than a hotel like this, than most of your uh, office uh, buildings. If you add in pharmaceuticals, people have sometimes said, well, you guys are carbon neutral. Jeez, we're not even close. We, we, we got down to decreasing our energy expenditure. We have more renewables than we use in energy. But if you take in drugs and pharmaceuticals, it's a huge carbon footprint, a giant carbon footprint. We, we're, we're working on that. We haven't got there. We believe energy costs eventually will escalate to try and keep down the cost. So if we're taking care of the whole community, we have to say, not just wait till they get sick. We have an obligation to take care of their financial well-being as well. People in the community, this community, Dane County, La Crosse County, make decisions every day whether, uh, whether to have food, heat, or take their medicines. All the time, all the time. We have an obligation. If we're gonna take care of the community, take care of the financial piece. 15 years as a CEO, our fee increases were less than the year before. A forced function to keep our cost to the community down. So, thanks. Um, let me tell you, my vice presidents didn't clap every year when I announced that's what we're going to do again. They said, no, but kids, we're really doing We're top some 1% one, 1 in the country. Every other business raises their prices. No, that's not our job. Drop your prices. Um, so yeah, I was a pain to work for, let me tell you. Um, um, so we, we believed we could do this and improve our bottom line. I'm going to spend a lot more time about it. And in healthcare now, we talk a lot about the triple aim. The triple aim healthcare improves improve the health of the population, lower the overall cost of care, and improve the patient experience. Not one, all three. And sustainability, of course, covers all of those boxes. We can cover all those boxes. Collins, you know Jim Collins, uh, a famous uh, writer, one of, the, one of his most famous books, Good to Great, had a big piece in it called um, um, Facing the brutal facts. Facing the brutal facts. So we, uh, we faced our brutal facts. Here's our brutal facts. In 2008, we were putting 72 million pounds of carbon dioxide into the air and 435,000 pounds of particulate. That's what makes you sick. That's what makes the babies that I took care of sick when they went home. It makes old people sick when they, 435,000 pounds of it and mercury. I thought mercury went away. Mercury was in the coal that we burned for the electricity, right? Mm. So mercury spreads out over acres and acres, several hundred acres of water contaminated by that amount of mercury. That is a big problem. We are the people. We got our electrical power from coal from Wyoming and uh, heat from natural gas from Texas, like most of the upper Midwest. We said we, we have to change that. But we're not just going to go out and say, 
well, let's buy electricity from green sources for 25 cents a kilowatt hour and then soak the patients as they walk in the door. Not fair. We said, we're smarter than that. We can do better than that. And we uh, chose to do that. We believed we could decrease our cost of care, we could improve the local economy, and we could show to the rest of the community and now the rest of the world um, that uh, this is what a strong corporate citizen looks like. And we've had many chances. I've got to go to the White House. I've got to um, talk at the Paris Climate Talks. I'm going to talk to ministers from, um, in Beijing from China here in January. Um, it is an opportunity to say, although I love the fact that it's improving our environment, you can do it in an economically sound way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Why would a board? Why would a board, many of you sit on boards, why would you allow it? It's consistent with the mission, that's for sure. We believed it was the best use of a portion of our savings. Now, this was a pretty, pretty radical change. I'm going to show you a graph on that. But we made the decision that rather than taking the money that we have, so any health, all the healthcare organizations here, any good healthcare organization has some savings. Where do they put it? Stocks, bonds, treasury bills, some cash. We took a portion of it, took 5% of that. Instead of having it sit in some nameless pool of money or <coughs> gold bars in your basement, we would take 5% and we use it for the good of the community to do all those things that I just mentioned about improving the economy and improving the health. So that was, that was our plan. You don't have to keep it all in those big bets. Now, the, if any of you guys are, work for Moody's or one of those guys that want to do our bond ratings, we spent a lot of time arguing with those people <laughs> that it was just as important. And turns out we won the day. Um, we had a good return on our investment compared to other, other investments. We, we were doing this in 2008 and 9, so it's pretty easy to make the argument it's safer than the stock market. So that timing was kind of good. Um, local investment, that people like that a lot. Timing was good, as I pointed out. And we got some early successes that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about. Now, some of this was what you'd expect, OK? Some of it, recycling rate above 40%. In the country, healthcare, when we started on this, the average was under 10, under 10% recycling rate. You make money on recycling. We could make money on recycling and reprocessing. In fact, we made so much money on it, we were able to pay for a sustainability coordinator. Again, not taking it out of the patients, taking it out of our being more thoughtful about how we do our work. Cafeteria food waste. Dropped at 80%, 80%. You know how much food we waste in this country? Half of all the food produced. Half of all the food, all, you, we're agricultural country. We waste half of the food between not getting to market and rotting and all kinds of things. There's so many things uh, why we waste so much food. We said that's not acceptable. We dropped it and we save a ton of money doing that. Has, Pharmaceutical waste, hazardous pharmaceutical waste. That's medicines. That's um, cancer uh, chemotherapy agents. What do most places in the country still do? Flush it down the drain. Flush it down the drain. Well, you go to the septic system, right? You've been to sewer plants. You've all been to sewer. No, you haven't. Um, <laughs> yeah, but a sewer plant, there's all this big black goo that's stirred up, and nothing survives that. Yeah, actually, it does. All kinds of stuff survives it cancer drugs, antibiotics, hormones, out into the water supply, out into the land, up into the air. Is that OK? It's not OK. We said it's not OK to do that. We said, but we're going to do it. How are we going to do it? Spend a lot of money? No, do it in a way that saves money. So we did it. It saves money. We dropped our hazardous pharmaceutical waste 17-fold, not 17%, 17-fold. Basic process improvement, figuring out how how, why do we have this waste? How to put it in a different place? How to order differently? How to not do it? Basic process improvement skills taught to frontline staff in the kitchen, to the nurses, to the people ordering, changed the face of what we're putting into the environment. We said it's our responsibility to do that. We didn't whine to somebody else. So what about the energy? What about, uh, we talked about the energy a lot. Energy was a big deal. The key to the energy piece is the middle of the slide, not all cute pictures. It's conservation. Conservation is where everybody should start. It, um, 
It is has the best financial return and gets you the easiest returns. Are these other things cooler? Sure, we got the chef up there doing the food waste things. Got wind turbines. Everybody loves wind turbine. That wind turbine closest in the picture. They let me climb, stand up at 380 feet in the air, looking out over the world. The winds, right? It's great, right? Yeah, but that's not where most people are going to go. Most people are going to go conservate. You don't think I'd climb up that tower? I climbed up that tower, man. <laughs> they, they said, a CEO climbed the tower. I said, not going to do it. It's not going to happen. I said, no, no, I can, I can climb, really. So they, so they sent you know, some old guys, 50 or something, to, to go with me. And then a, and then a kid um, <clears throat> put harnesses on and go to climb it. So the kid and I raced to the top. And somewhere way down below, I heard the old guy who was 14 years younger than me saying, you know, there's platforms to stop at if you want. I said, crap, I'm not. I'm not going to let this kid beat me to the top. So we climbed the top of that. But that's exciting and that's fun. The hard work, the hard work is doing, is doing conservation. So it should be your first fuel. Here's, here's how we got it through our board. You're all saying, oh my God, what is he even spending all this money? I spent $2 million. Any CFOs in this room? CFOs. I want to see the CFOs who have an investment better than the one on the slide. Spend $2 million, and every year, every year thereafter, I get a million three back. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's hard to argue with that. Took that to the board, measured it hard. I didn't measure it. We had engineers measure it, outside folks measure it. We really went after it very carefully and, and showed that by doing not sexy things like building a wind turbine and letting me climb on it, but doing basic things, change the lights, look at pumps and motors. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, we're so good on time here. I'm gonna tell you a little story. So look right above the O and N and conservation. See these guys looking at that, uh, that big fan looking thing? This was 2008. In 2003, we built that building, brand new building. It looks like nice buildings around here. It's glass and steel. It's all modern furniture. It's looking good. So it's good, right? It's good. Do an energy audit. Completely stunk. It was terrible. We said, my God, how come he's terrible? So our engineers, some GE engineers, some people from train company went and we looked through this place. <clears throat> that fan, two more like it sitting on top of this building, going around and around and around. It's doing its job, right? Right. Saturday afternoon. It's a five-day-a-week building. It's an outpatient building. The fans are running 24-7, 365. Tons of air exchanges, unneeded, complete waste, a complete waste. Engineer went over the wall, opened up the box, turned the thing, click, click, set the dials, but saved us $19,000 a year in about three seconds. And that wasn't the only one. All over the, we found many, many of these. Every institution we've gone into, we've had hospital, we had, uh, so two million, million threes, 60% return, right? So we've had places with 54, 47, 39, 78% returns on their money for conservation. What does it add up to? Well, it adds up to, since 2008, we are 53% more efficient in our buildings. Okay, so now I want you to think about 53% more efficient. So with that kind of return on the money, now we're spending less on that. When people say, what about the pipelines, Jeff? And how come you're not speaking? What about the, the uh, overhead power lines? I said, well, one of the most important pieces is if you want to affect change, make it economically feasible to affect the change. If everybody in the country were 53% more efficient in their energy use, then the discussions about what we're going to use for power, how much we need to transmit it, would be a lot different. The economic advantage would be on the other side. So I, what I'm saying is we, we, we tried to demonstrate what we believed, and that would be it'd be the best for the health and well-being of the community and the community at large for us to follow this forward. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have time. I'm guaranteeing I'm going to have time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate uh, to save them up. Um, we set a goal in 2008 to, by 2014, be the first healthcare system um, to be 100% powered by renewable energy. 
doesn't get you to carbon neutral, but it was still a pretty remarkable goal. And we had a clear path on how to get there. No, we didn't. We had no idea how we were going to get there. We, we, we didn't know. We didn't know. We said, this is what we ought to do, and we're going to make money at it, and we're going to improve the local economy. We're not going to take it out of the patient's hide. So we said conservation, conservation, conservation. We did some wind pieces. Biogas um, was a landfill in La Crosse. We, you, know, you can't work with the government. It's baloney. We worked with our county government. They dropped a pipeline from the landfill down to our northern campus. Um, we put in an engine. We heat, power, and cool that campus, 1,200 people on that campus, with gas from the landfill that was formerly just burning up into the atmosphere. Gas from the landfill, they get $250,000, a quarter million dollars a year they never had before. Taxpayers are happy, right? Helps the local economy. That's a good thing. We save money every single day, and our staff are so proud that they're in a building completely heat and powered and cooled with renewable, renewables. It is, it is a, a four, three, four year return for the county. It's about a seven year return on investment for us. That's a good, that is, um, that is a good return. Did all these make a ton of money? They all didn't make a ton of money. Um, conservation I already talked about. The wind farms kind of depend on what your tariff rate is. You you pay 10 or 12 or 14 cents a kilowatt hour. If we put electricity onto the grid, we get paid sometimes 10 or 11 cents a kilowatt hour and sometimes 2 cents a kilowatt hour. Over in Minnesota, we had a wind farm. We were making uh, electricity they were selling for 17 cents a kilowatt hour. We were getting paid a penny and a half. That one wasn't making money. That didn't make money. The conservation stuff had to carry that for a while. The landfill already talked about a biomass boiler. Natural gas from Texas. I don't have anything against Texas. Actually, I do. But I, but I, I, I don't have anything personally against Texas. But I don't want to spend my money, your money, on natural gas from Texas. So we put in a very high-tech biomass boiler. Burns hardwood chips, 1,300 degrees that were formerly sitting on the ground. And instead of natural gas from Texas, we heat, and then we put a generator in front of it, heat and power our hospital, put a geothermal field in that that power then runs. So we heat and power and cool on hardwood chips from Wisconsin. Improves on resilience in case there's a, a major disaster and the, and the lines go down. It's all local. We were able, able to help move ourselves forward, save money about $2,000 a day installing that system for the new hospital. Dairy biogas is pretty close to home for you. The, the, uh, there's a, a problem in Dane County with uh, phosphorus mitigation. Also, your landfills are, uh, have a lot of pressure on them. And so there was some money set aside to try and help mitigate that. We uh, volunteered to help get in the middle. So some money came from that. We, we invested some of our own, built a dairy digester um, that is producing 14% of all the electri electricity uh, equivalents that are in consumed by Gunderson. And we're making money on it. And we're solving a problem. Tens of thousands of pounds of manure goes into it, tons, uh, tons of manure, and 40% and amount, so over a third equal amount of grease and other biologics from the Madison area that would go into the landfill is being used in the digester. It actually improves improves the efficiency of cow poop if you put pizza grease in with it to make methane. Who knew? Yeah, you know, you didn't think you were going to learn anything today. <laughs> now you learned something. I mean, I mean, you you never know what you're going to learn coming to Rotary. I, I tell you, it's a great place. Um, what what about? What didn't work so well, uh, solar hot water in the daycare. The kids love washing their hands with sunshine. It's got about a 25-year payback um, on that project. Not so good. Brewery biogas, really shortly. Biggest marketing success ever. We're going to build, you know, I, I, we win a whole bunch of awards, and they put uh, Gunderson at the head of the newspaper, best uh, health system in the upper Midwest, did all these great things. and. You know, I get about two emails, a couple attaboys, three staff members say, well, I'm proud of us, uh, Dr. Thompson. It's great. Two weeks later, we announce we're going to take beer gas, run it through a motor, 
turn it into electricity, 10,000 websites pick up the story. <laughs> Hundreds of people send me emails saying, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> it was a marketing success and a complete fail because two weeks later, two months later, something changed. How many of you have ever had one of those Mike's Hard Lemonades? You know, one of those uh, things? Yeah, you can all leave. Yeah. Um, they started doing that stuff, and they cleaned their vats with sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid killed our engine. We said, hey, stop doing that. They said, oh, no, we're selling this like tankerfuls. We're not changing a thing. Started killing your engine. We picked the engine up. We moved it to Middleton, and it's now producing electricity 24-7 in Middleton. That was a financial loss. So you can't win them all. But it was eventually good. It, it was eventually uh, a good. Now, what about the investment? Where did the money come from? Where did the money come from? Everyone said, what do you, where does the money come from? Well, I told you about this. We looked at our overall savings. We took 5% of our savings and put it into energy infrastructure. Our return was 10 to 12%. Conservation, the wins, the losses. The rest of our, the rest of our portfolio got 5 to 6%. It was a sound investment. We made a sound investment. This will help lower the cost of care. The economy was boosted. The landfill I talked about, the biogas we talked about, the wind turbine, all, all this helps the local economy. And we're decreasing um, our, our pollution. We also stopped investing in fossil fuels as a matter of principle, as a healthcare organization, take care of sick people. Uh, to invest in something that makes them sick seemed, yeah, not, not congruent. So we stopped doing that. So, so biomass and biogas are good for Wisconsin. There's something that I don't understand and that I argued with the governor and a variety of other people about. We are an energy importer. $15 billion of our money goes for outside energy. You all have run businesses. Anything you have to buy on the outside is hard on your business. Anything Wisconsin has to buy from the outside I mean, is hard on us. We have to make it up some other way. We figured out a way to generate the electricity and our heat, our heat and power from inside sources. So we're not taking the money from Wisconsin and sending it to Wyoming or Texas. That is a good fiscal thing. I'm not saying you can instantly turn to this, but I'm saying if we do it in a thoughtful, rational way, this is good for your business, it's good for the economy, and it's good for the people that you're supposed to be serving. So, so we believed that this would be better, and it would have many other, many other benefits in regards to uh, keeping the phosphorus out and keeping um, uh, other activities, even great side products like the cleverly named Utterly green organic compost <laughs> from the cow manure. Funny, huh? is that? No, you don't think that's funny? No, I thought it was pretty weird too. Um, so let's get back to part of our underpinning. I, I tried to convince you we're making money on this, but are we really helping the health and well being of the environment? Well, when I was in Paris, Fortune 500 companies were making pledges. It's by 2030, 30% decrease. By 2050, 50% decrease. Countries were making those pledges. By 2050, we're going to get to 50%. In eight years, we got to 90% less, greenhouse gases and particulate matter. And we made money. And we improved our local economy. So instead of coal from Wyoming, natural gas from Texas, we got it all local. So, so you, can't, you can't stare me in the face and say, you're just a tree hugger. Well, I worry about the economy and jobs. Yeah, it's, just, it's just crap. It's just not science. It's not what can be done. You can do this. You can do it. I'm not saying it's easy. None of this is easy, and it wasn't perfect. I, I showed you w one of my many mistakes. So there's a lot of very interesting things that happened at, at Paris besides me getting to brag. I was the only healthcare organization in the, green, in the blue zone uh, uh, in, uh, for, at the US Pavilion. There's a lot of things that went on there. The Pope and the US president are enormously powerful in the world. They're very powerful. And people listen and pay attention to what they have to say. Um, there, there's absolute clarity on who's to blame in the world. And that'd be us. Big maps are up all the time. Western Europe and the United and North America, 
big balloons of who's to cause the problem. And then next to it, here's who's going to get injured. Whoops, I'm supposed to stay over here. Here's who's going to get injured. And it was all the rest of the world. I mean, that, was, that part was absolutely clear. Um, regardless of how people uh, vote and, and talk about it, big pharma, big tech, all, all these people, everybody was there. Fortune 500 companies, everybody was there and are wanting to be a part of this. Um, Australia and the United States are the uh, last two loud countries in the world that are still denying climate is uh, killing people in the world. Um, it, is, it is, I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. There's just nobody else that's actually still stuck there. Um, the most outlandish demand is uh, the oil states wanted to get paid for leaving their oil in the ground. We mostly laugh that one off. Um, the most disappointing doables, all the health pieces in the climate accord were mostly written out. People didn't want to didn't want to agree to that. They didn't want to admit that they were killing their own people. That's what it came down to, which of course we are. Um, and the best quote was from a Saudi prince to his people, saying the Stone Age didn't end uh, because of a lack of stones. <laughs> that was clever. That was very good. I, I was so I, I was very impressed. Okay, so as we move to questions, I here's. Here's the summary. We, we didn't set out to say we're going to be the greenest and put a billboard up. Um, we said we're going to make their better. We're going to lower the cost of care. We're going to improve our local economy. We're going to show others what an organization that really serves its community uh, looks like. That and being able to look my granddaughter in the face 15 years from now and say, yeah, we actually did something. Questions? Yes. As I understand it, Gunderson is a nonprofit entity. If you ever become CEO of a profit-making corporation, would you let us know so we can buy stock? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Mrs. Thompson is not allowing me to apply for many CEO jobs right away. But uh, thank you for the encouragement. I, I, I um, liked it. Yes, dear. So I'm wondering, what was the impulse? So was it cost savings? Was it we want to do the right thing? Like how in your role as ICUP to CEO did you say, hey, we should take this on as one of our strategic objectives? Um, well, that's a good question. I think it morphs over time. That I think for a long time, I grew up in rural Wisconsin. I, you know, taught at Boy Scout camps and got some of the ethos about uh, outside uh, things. I, I, uh, you know, was raised in a Methodist family that thought about uh, the greater good and those things and and uh, had uh, you know some international experience um, and so I I, um, I I looked at it as part of the full package I said we're going to take care of the community how can we take care of the community that really changes it and actually um, uh, I read a book called natural capitalism um, by Hawkins Lovins and Lovins um, it's 15 20 years old now but it really it really said uh, several things. It said, we don't, we don't value or pay anything for all the natural resources come out of the ground. If we actually paid for that, paid what they're worth, it would change everything. But even if we don't do that, you can make a business case for being more sustainable. It's just not easy. You have to do it. So we just said, we're going to make that case. And we're not going to take it out of the hides of the business people or the patients. We're gonna just going to be smarter, figure out how to do it. And we, we got lots of partners, lots of help from a lot of people. Um, hello. Karen well, Kevin Hands. Um, we are apparently poised for some turmoil as people try again to repeal Obamacare, possibly with more success. Is there a silver lining opportunity to get some of your principles into rejiggering possibly the healthcare system? Oh, so that's an advertisement my, for my book on values-based leadership coming out in March. Thanks. Thanks, I appreciate it. You, should, you could hit the bell if, if you wanted to on that. So, um, um, well, you know, I mean, uh, there, there, were, there were a lot of people that wrote me, and, and I've been a part of groups who said, oh, my goodness, what's going what's gonna to happen in healthcare, and what's going to happen with the environmental issues? Um, 
you know, Paul Ryan came on, Paul, who I've met and talked with, Paul, you know, first thing he said after the election was, good, we'll put the, we'll be able to put the coal miners back to work uh, in West Virginia, that'll be great. And I said, I'd love to put them back to work, but not on coal. Um, here's, here's a statistic for you. Last year, last year, China built two wind turbines and a football field of solar panels installed every hour. Every hour. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to put people doing coal back to work. Just have, they need to do different work. I mean, we can, you, you put them back to work building buggy whips too. But that, that um, is for an era that went by. So my message to, to folks is to say, um, communities still need to be taken care of. States Neil, still need to be taken care of. The environment still needs to be taken care of. He healthy and well people still need to be taken care of. We have done a zillion things with governments as they go up and down. Um, we can do that again. Uh, it, it's back to my point about um, you, you know you want to you want to take on the coal companies. Everybody in the room could improve the conservation efforts in your facilities and in your homes and the people that you're connected to in the schools you're responsible for and the government agency. You, you could make all that and then start forcing a economic equation that would change things. So by no means, <clears throat> and you probably figured this out by now, I'm not much of a sit around and flop and stew kind of person. I just, you just go after it. We're just going to have to go after it. And the government is always, you, you can, we've never imagined the government's going to fix everything. It's not going to fix everything in the next four years. But there's a lot of things we can do on our own with or without the, f the federal government leaning one way or another. So I'm, I'm pretty much a gear up and go after it kind of person. I've got a question here. Yes. Um, this is a serious question. In the next couple of years, we need a really good candidate with your kind of thinking for governor. And <laughs> might you think about that? Um, well, thank you. That's quite a compliment. Uh, the governor of uh, a state has a huge responsibility, and I appreciate your uh, confidence. I'm, Mrs. Thompson thinks I'm kind of busy right now, so <laughs> might not have time for that. OK. Uh, thank you, though. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's your whole presentation is very reasonable. But it looks like uh, we have a. Uh, I was going president. for inspiring, really. But, Very um, inspiring. <laughs> sorry. I, I, I'll, well, I'll work also, on it a it's also reasonable, and people seem to believe this is true. Uh, we have a president elect who doesn't seem to believe what you're saying. Right. And we have a, a problem in the country where people in coal mining don't believe they're going to get lung, black lung disease or COPD or lung cancer, and that uh, we should go back to that. What about the educational aspect to this? So are we living in a bubble that, you know, we have uh, Gunderson doing great work, by the way, holding wisdom uh, here in, um, in Middleton also has a building which is quite energy efficient. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No. But it's quite good. Uh, Jim, Jim Rooley, uh, you know the building, Holy Wisdom Monastery? Yeah, I know Jim is nice. a, Jim is a uh, supporter of that. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. There we go. But isn't it true that? Yeah. So, I, so, I was very impressed when I, when I visited there. Anyway, I think we have a problem in this country of education. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, Governor, uh, what, what is your solution? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I, I, think, I think that we always have problems. We're always going to have problems. And I tend not to focus on exactly who's responsible. In fact, you know, I spent my whole life making fun of CEOs. And then when I became a CEO, I had even better material because I knew them all. <laughs> and I continue to make fun of them. I, I, I think they have a huge responsibility in leadership, but I think we have a giant responsibility. We don't abdicate our responsibilities. I, I think the approach is to say, of we, we have so much power. 
if you put the healthcare organizations and the school systems together and the business community together and say, we are going to drive for a smarter, healthier, more sustainable economy that is based on the future, not the past, you can get to a size of people that can make significant impact on the well-being of the breadth of the population, not just not just a few, but the breadth of the population. So, so my contention is that education starts with the people that want to get educated, moves to the people that are willing to get educated, and then, and then you only have a few stragglers left. And uh, we'll bring those along when we can bring them along. Um, I think our time's up. I'll be here for a little bit afterwards. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. Have a great rest of the week. And we will send out the PowerPoint and email address for Dr. Thompson. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.